Okay, those of you at home, um, sorry if you have COVID. Dallas is from Australia. Um, so you should be able to see my screen now. If you cannot say something or, or text. So this, um, oh wait, I just want to, that, that, that my video is also on the video. Now. Okay, that's my OCD. So, so the, the next topic I want to discuss. So, topic one was about humans and how you humans use animals for all kinds of things, and how you humans use animals for uh, research. And now I'm going to move on to this uh, book. A uh, book that, that is it's on the uh, it's on the canvas as well, a PDF form. I just scanned it because I, I couldn't find a, a copy. Um, it's out of print, basically. And I'm going to discuss a lot. I'll, I'll get to it. I won't say too much about it now. So this topic two is about Russell and Birch, who wrote, who wrote a longer version of that book. That's, the, that's an abridged version. Um, I want to talk a little bit about their concept. So Russell and Birch's concept of humanity, uh, about replacement, about reduction, and about refinement, and how they um, how they all fit in. So again, it's a, it's topic two, not lecture two. So this is a few going to be a few lectures, I think, too. But let's see. Okay. I think this is my extension hole, but I can't see my own slides. So, um, so um, that was a nice thing about being home uh, because I could do it for my own. So, um, so these two fellas, that's Rex uh, Birch, the tall guy, and Bill Russell, the smaller guy. Um, Rex Birch uh, was a British microbiologist, and William Moy Stratton Russell was a zoologist, a psychologist, a classical scholar, and a very interesting and dynamic man. He was a singer, pretty poor singer, I hope you won't want me saying. Uh, and he wrote his own songs, and he wrote his songs about science, basically, about three years of validation. Uh, Rex Birch, I don't know too much about Rex, uh, probably because he was a typical English man, I'm assuming, reserved, calculated, and together they formed a great team. Um, and they were asked by Major Charles Hume, um, circa 1950, 1955 maybe, um, to do a systematic review on the use of animals in the United Kingdom. And um, so they went out and they interviewed people and they, they visited labs and they put this book together. Um, don't remind me if I forget to change the slide there too. Uh, which was called the principles of humane experimental technique and um, and it wasn't meant as a, as a, a public dissemination book it was really a scientific system, systemic review of, of, of the use of animals at that time it was in 1959 but because it was a little bit hard to digest i, I have to be honest i didn't read the original book because i can't find it i would love to read it um Michael Bowles, who was the head of ECFAM, decided to make an abridged version, and he was selling it from, where was it? Oh yeah, he was selling it from Frame, um, which was an organization uh, to facilitate the alternative animal testing, but I think he was the head or part of the head um, of it. Um, and this was published in 2009 in, uh, in Nottingham, where actually Michael is from. Um, not Michael several times, nice guy. Um, and so he, he tries to make this digestible. And I want you to read it. So it is on the, it's, it's part of the course material. Um, I don't need you to learn it or anything, but please read it. Uh, I think it's really important. And it's funny, there's a, there's a lot of scientists uh, to talk about three hours. I bet you very few of them have read this book or even the, the, the parent book, which is The Principles of the Humane Experiment. I think. And it's a critical book because that book, and the thinking of, of Rex and Birch, uh, or sorry, Russell and Birch, led to the, I think, 
it was in 1987, I think, was that directive that put the uh, animal welfare for experimentation into EU law. And it meant if there was an alternative in the, in the EU that you had to use the alternative. You, you were not allowed to use the animals. Um, but that's all complicated, and we'll talk about that. And it has been updated several times uh, uh, over the years. Well, maybe just once or twice. So um, this is, I think, a quotation from. Sorry, I'll change that one. So this, I think, a quotation from from uh, Michael. Although a large number of people say they are committed to supporting the tree or concept of reduction, refinement, replacement, as put forward by Russell and Birch, most of them have not read the book itself. The result is that the great benefits afforded by a careful consideration and dedication application of principles have not been achieved. So that's why I want you to read the book. And that's part of your assignments. I mean, if you do, well, yeah, whenever you do it, but just do it. It's really easy to read. So now it's important to state that this was not an anti-animal um, activity. Um, at the time, and even today, animals are fundamental parts of research, and we probably wouldn't be able to do any of the things. So we insert all drugs, basically, that are on the market today, with a few exceptions, have been designed and developed in animals and applied to humans. So there, there's nothing in principle wrong with animal experimentation, and they said that in the book. So they said, we owe to animal experimentation many, if not most, of the benefits of modern medicine and countless advances in fundamental scientific knowledge. So they said this early in the book, so they're not against it. And they didn't think at the time that anybody would think they would be. But I think now, when you talk about the three years, people say this is against, or not, this is, we shouldn't do animal experimentation. Well, we shouldn't probably do animal experimentation, but only when we're ready, right? And we're not ready at all yet. So, so we need to use, still use animals. But they wanted to find out, could we use animals in a better way? And is there, is, there, is there principles they could instill or think about? And that's why when they interviewed all these people, they put it all together. And then Russell and Birch came up with this very interesting thing about reduction, refinement, and replacement. And they were very clever. I mean, the iteration or the alliteration of the tree, er, 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 was also clever. Um, now, so that being said, there is, of course, many people that are completely against using animals for any purposes at all. And I mentioned about uh, some people even think we shouldn't have pets. And this is dangerous, you know. So when I was in, so I, I, when I was a young man in, in, in UCD, University College Dublin, before I came there, there was an animal facility. And it used to be we had on the animal facilities, we used to state it, it was on the map. And so we would throw Google Maps, but they would say, this is the animal facility of University College Dublin. And we were proud of it, you know, because that's where all the real research was done and the animals were housed there, nicely looked after, and then brought to the labs when needed. And one Sunday afternoon, and you have to remember, you don't know, but University College Dublin was a big campus. Um, so it was like green fields everywhere, really nice campus, very old uh, place. And so there was, yeah, so there was grass and people used to walk their dogs and stuff like that. Uh, you know, during the day, even on, a, on Sundays, especially. And these crazy lunatics, I mean, lunatics, broke into the animal facility and let all the animals out. I mean, these, these are domesticated animals, they can't survive in the wild, you know, it's stupid, yeah. And of course, the dogs killed them all. I mean, dog sees rabbit, boom, and the rabbits didn't know what to do, they didn't even know to run away. So one rabbit was killed, the other rabbit was looking at what the hell is that animal there? And that boom, killed again. And I, I wasn't there, but somebody described it to me. It's idiotic, you know, it's stupid. But, but, but then what's really dangerous is those idiots who released the minks in England several times because minks survive well in the wild. So now we have this invasive species in England that outcompete all of the beautiful, wonderful stoats and stuff like that. And, and it's because these idiots who are against animal testing don't know anything about it and then release wild domesticated animals or even dangerous animals into the wild. I mean, it's annoying. So, um, so that's the bad side of thinking, this thinking. Um, but it's good sides. And these Russell and Birch are really, really good at this, you know. So 
The central theme is what is humanity and what is inhumanity. And don't be flippant that you think you know this, right? Let's, let's discuss it. Let's, 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 let's really think about it. Um, so what is humane? These are deep things, you know? This is not just, I know what it means. So look, let's look, go through all the definitions. So humane is characterized by kindness, mercy, sympathy, inflicting as little pain as possible. You can have a humane killing, right? So um, we do that in America. It's still, there's still people killed, killed um, if they've committed a terrible crime. And what they do is they do this as humanely as possible. So they sedate them, they give them a, a pain, um, so an anti-pain compound, and then they inject them with potassium chloride, which makes the heart go into ventricular fibrillation and they sort they die quickly. I mean, they used to have those the electric chair, which is awful. I mean, I don't know why, I, I don't know why they did that, but they, but now it's 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 this three injections. So an anesthetic, a pain relief, and then the last one is the potassium chloride. Um, so I, I don't I don't believe that's very humane, but if you're gonna if you're gonna kill somebody, that's the best way to do it, right? Um, there's also uh, civil, civilizing or liberal. And I have the donkey up here. I have no idea why the donkey represents the Democratic Party. Maybe somebody knows. No, but so the Democratic Party in the US, the Republicans would call them liberal, right? As a as a slur. You know, oh, they're liberals, you know. But to be liberal isn't a bad thing, in my opinion. To be liberal is a good thing. It's 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 being humane, it's being nice to people, it's not a soft thing. Um now what's inhumane? It's it's the opposite of that, or almost the opposite, is to be extremely cruel or brutal. Uh, you can see this uh, the synonyms here: savage, severe, harsh, grim, unkind. Heartless, atrocious, unsympathetic, hellish, depraved, barbarous, pitiless, unfeeling, uncompassionate. And the sad thing is, humans have huge capacity to be humane, and they have probably the equal capacity to be inhumane. And you can see it from our history. You can see it what people do to animals. To be honest, we're getting better at that. But just look at what we did to ourselves. Yeah, think of the Holocaust. Uh, think of all those war crimes. Think of the 19, in 1914 when we sent something like 3 million boys aged 17 to go and kill each other in the Battle of the Somme. I mean, it's a disgrace. I hope we never go back there. I'm very scared of what's going on in the Ukraine at the moment. Uh, so we can be cruel, but we can be, we can be also wonderful people. Um, and I think every single person has the capacity for both. And you know, that's why all those films are made about Darth Vader and stuff like that, because it's in us. B, I can be horribly cruel and I can be also beautifully humane. Yeah. So how do we apply this to animal test? So we have to define what a humane experiment is, knowing all of that. And the thing is, let's say, oh, it doesn't matter, right? It's science, it can be cruel for science, right? So forget, why are we even talking about it? Because this is a quote from, from uh, Rosalind Birch, it is widely recognized that humanest possible treatment of, experiment anim of experimental animals, far from being an obstacle, is actually a prerequisite for successful animal experimentation. So you treat the animals well, then they are more normalized, they're less stressed, and the experiment will be better. You need less animals actually to do that. That's, that's part of the central thesis of this. The central problem is that, that of determining what is and what is not humane and how humanity can be promoted without prejudice to scientific and medical aims. So it's also not clever to do an experiment that needs to have some element of pain if it's part of the experiment and don't do it correctly because then you're also wasting an animal. I mean, we talked about leather boots, right? I think, uh, and I mean, if, if the ladder is there already, you may as well use it uh, because cows are not killed for ladder, contrary to popular belief. So um, we have to then define what is the stress? Do animals fear? What's the biological and neurological basis of fear, right? So how do we, 
how do we how do we delineate this humanity versus inhumanity? And there's there's a big difference between stress and distress, physiologically, anatomically, and, uh, and psychologically. So stress is sometimes fun. I mean, if you give a lecture, not me anymore, but I used to, I used to get really nervous about giving lectures. And, uh, um, and I was stressed, but I wasn't distressed. Um, and if you have permanent stress, that can make you distressed. And that's important, we'll get back to that. Do animals fear? And what's the biological and neurological basis of that? Let's see. So um, this is, we know quite a lot now about the, the old part of the brain, and we're learning quite a bit about the new part of the brain. I mean old, because it's evolutionary old. And we know that all of our emotions and stuff, they're in the old part, they're not in the new part. Our, our, the new part is speech and stuff like that, thinking. The old part is the limbic system, and it's the most evolutionary preserved part. Um, and it's right at the bottom of your brain, let's say pointing towards your throat. And this is called the limbic system. It's an evolutionary primitive structure. Uh, it's deep in the temporal uh, lobe above the brainstem, and it controls the primitive emotions. And lecturers from this field like to try and be funny, and they called it the four Fs, feeding, fighting, fleeing or flighting, and sexual behavior. It's funny right um, now, if you think about it, and if you know, well, maybe you didn't know that before, but it's, uh, sorry, I should go back. So if you think about that, what's your core emotions? Hunger, right? Fear, and fear is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, boys like to fight, but I know women fight too. I've seen them uh, physically and on Twitter and stuff like that. And uh, uh, running away um, uh, from, from, a, from a, um, a problem, uh, I mean, a, a physical confrontation and, and sex. I mean, uh, we all have sex drives, different sex drives and, and the changes uh, throughout your life and depending on who you're with and stuff like that. But this is, this is, this is core to being a human. We think, well, it's not. It's core to nearly all. Uh, high level animals, uh, including all mammals and birds. So we feel these things the same as the mouse does. So we, we, we need to consider our experimental animals for that reason. The scary face point as well. So I put this up because if you see this quickly, you know, you know when you sent these things on WhatsApp or something, and, and it's something else, and it's a GIF actually, and you don't know, and then it turns into that, and scares the living shit out of it. That's what that would do if I flash it really quickly, right? Why? Because we also have this thing, and this might be more human. No, it's not, because monkeys have it. That if we see somebody who's afraid, we get afraid. Because that's a cool kind of um, social thing, right? So if you're afraid, I'm afraid for a second, because why are you afraid? I mean, is there something? Is there a snake or something like that? That's why we yawn. And nearly all animals yawn. And I think that's why at least humans yawn. Because when I yawn, right, and you yawn back, let's try. <laughs> now you're all resisting the temptation to yawn, right? Yeah. It's because if I yawn, um, I, there's nothing behind you. There's not a line behind you. I'm not going to yawn if there's a line behind you. And if you yawn back, I know there's no line behind me. So we have this amazing capacity to sense emotions in members of our, other spe of, of our own species. Um, and fear is just so primal, it's easy. It's an easy one to, to make as an example. And that's, that's, that's actually not exactly where the fear center. It's the, it's the left amygdala, it's, if it gets activated. If you put somebody in a, um, an MRI, um, which can which can measure basically I think it's an MRI but anyway there's these machines that can measure brain activity by measuring glucose consumption and uh, if you scare somebody in in one of those machines it's the left amygdala that is that is firing and if you if you damage the left amygdala of, of animals they don't sense fear anymore and I'm not sure if the slides about this but it's funny if you do it to monkey well not funny but if you, if you, <laughs> if you damage a monkey's brain they, they're not afraid of snakes. And they're 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 usually horribly afraid of snakes, and it's a it's a cultural basis fear. I mean, all of those spooky films that we like and horror films. And, I mean, I love The Shining. It's a fantastic film, and it scares you, and you like to be scared. 
So that's 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 and it's stress. It's a little stress. It's good. Good. Little stress is good. Uh, and we all have it. Uh, all all mammals and, and birds as well, I guess. Um, so stimulation of certain par parts of the amygdala causes anxiety and intense fear. The amygdala also encodes memories that evoke fear. So you all know, you know, you know the anecdote. I mean, it probably happens to you as well. You hear, you hear a song that makes you remember something in your life. You haven't even remember where you were. But that's not even that great, great of a, a memory of evocation. Smell is the best. So when you, every time I smell grass, horribly I think of doing my exams. So, so Charlie will not do the leaving cert. You know, it's yeah. the most stressful thing I've ever done in my life. And it's in June in Ireland. Uh, and it's when people were mowing the grass. Every time I smell the grass, I mean, I like the smell of grass, but it's like, <clears throat> even so. It's the best weather, too. And it's always the best weather, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but smell, and it's really linked to the, to the amygdala. And that, that evolved actually mostly, I think, that if we ate something bad and we got sick, then it would, uh, we wouldn't eat it again because you'd never eat it the rest of your life because it, it made you sick. Now, it might not have. That might not have been the cause, but you associate with it. I know somebody who doesn't like eggs at all. Even the smell makes him feel sick. I assume when he was young, because he, he doesn't remember this, he had a rotten egg, which are horrible. And from then on, his body said, they're toxic. Now, every time he smells it, he said, no. But this was about the, uh, about the monkeys and the snakes. So if you destroy the amygdala, uh, you have uh, the fear reaction and uh, autonomic endocrine manifestations are gone. And monkeys are no longer afraid of snakes. And it's funny to, to see this, these videos because the um, if you put a snake in monkey, with monkeys who even have never seen a snake before, they're, they're, they're somehow inherently scared of them. And if you break this, they pick the, up the snake and play with it and stuff like that. And uh, it's, it's a strange thing. And this is all in this ancient, 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 ancient part of our brain. And this part of our brain, let's talk a little bit more about it, is the amygdala. Uh, mammals all have a very extremely similar limbic system uh, and, it's, and, it's, and a similar amygdala in, on its own. Um, and it is even evidence that birds have something comparable. It's probably uh, di divergent evolution, or con sorry, convergent evolution, uh, or maybe not, I don't know. And, but their amygdala is called the nucleus uh, tineum. Um, so the primary process of acute stress and fear is the same for higher order animals. And I mean by that, uh, mammals and birds. So let's talk a little bit about the fight or flight response. So the hypothalamus activates the sy sympathetic nervous system, which dilates the pupils. So you get more eyes, uh, light into your eyes, so you can see better. It accelerates the heartbeat and raises the blood pressure. So you have better perfusion of the vital organs and muscles, so you can run faster. Um, it constricts the blood vessels of the skin. And this, uh, they say it's for, to limit uh, bleeding from wounds, but it's, it's probably just more blood for the heart um, and for your visceral organs. Um, it elevates plasma glucose, uh, free fatty acids, so you have more energy. Um, so, in a way, this fight or flight response acutely, it makes a super version of you. You're ready to go. You're stronger. You're less. You're in, in a way, you're less fearful because you're going to knock the block off that guy who said something about your mom, right? Um, you're Superman, basically. You're a super girl. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful part of evolution. This uh, fight and flight response. Um, and we like it so much that we use it for gaming. So we get addicted to the games because it makes us feel like, like really cool. I started, I got addicted to uh, that, uh, uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I think I played it for 120 hours or something like that. Wonderful, immersive game. Um, I suggest play it, but play it in moderation. Um, and so we love gaming and we love like betting and stuff like that. We, we like to be scared. But acutely, not, not chronic. So, Russell and Birch state that acute fear or alarm does not need to be distressing if there's a possibility to react. 
So as I said, if you can if you can run away or fight the guy, fine. Uh, fight and avoidance are evolutionary conserved processes. Uh, so so they are responses. So basically, all animals, higher order animals, have that, right? But you have to remember the flight is not an option for the laboratory animal. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you've all thought about or watched the film where you saw somebody that was put in prison for 20 years. If it, if whether they did it or didn't do it, it doesn't matter. But you can see how stressful that is for an individual to be locked away. Um, so yeah, this this thing that we put animals in cages is a concerning thing, right? So um, the potential for persistent fear and distress is is there. And also in hierarchical societies where all our domesticated animals are, including our, our mice and rats, our laboratory mice and rats, they they have they fight with each other. If so, we, we often move animals in cages. So I've done it myself by accident. I put I put a rat in a, in a cage uh, back after I anesthetized it, and all the other he must have been the alpha rat, and all the other rats attacked it. It was shocking to see because he was asleep. And I had to run and get a technician. And the technician just put a big glove in and pulled out and he said, right. But they, they they had him bleeding, you know? So they, they fight amongst themselves. I don't mean to say at all that laboratory animals aren't well treated. I mean, I just was, I was naive back then. I wasn't well trained, I think. Um, they're really well treated for the most part. I've heard some horrible stories, but of course, there's always the exceptions. But they're really well treated. And we're going to talk about that in later lectures. Uh, enrichment of cages and stuff like that. So there, we treat them as well as we can, really we do, but still they're in a cage, they can't run away. Um, and this is, I, I just love this man, Gary Larson. He's the funniest cartoonist ever. And he came out of retirement recently, recently to make more or something like this. So I like this because he basically, this exactly captures what I'm trying to say. So these two rats, I believe, are trying to run away from the cat, but the cat is always there because they can't run away because they're in a cage, right? And so the fear becomes distress. So the stress becomes distressing. And this happens, you, you have to think, if they, let's say, I don't know this for sure, but let's say if I were yellow and I go to feed my rats and I never wore yellow before and they don't like the color yellow, just me, and I always, I, my favorite jumper, yellow jumper, and I keep coming in with my yellow jumper and they're scared because they don't like their color. And we don't know what they see, basically. We can only guess. So maybe take the cat away from an idiot technician like myself with a yellow jumper. So they say as well, Russell and Birch, I mean, that awareness and, re and reaction to limited amount of features, moods, automatic behavior, and the lack of ver ver verbalization that should mean that we should consider much better. Now, this was written in 1959, right? So it's quite an old book now. But, uh, but I, th I, th I think people, I think that's really taken up now. But at the time, maybe not so much. So they said we really, really, the lack of verbalization of these animals and the inability to talk to us means we should be more careful, not less careful. Uh, Russell argues that these are the reasons we should treat animals with special consideration. I'm going to quote from the book now. Um, this is on page 11. And this is his quote about lack of verbalization. So R Russell argues that these are the reasons why we should treat animals with special consideration. consideration. The lower animal, and he means lower animal, he's talking about mice and rats basically here, I wouldn't consider the lower animal, but again, 1959. The lower animal is a slave of its own moods and behavior is very largely automatic. Uh, this also not true, I think. But anyway, we know that we ourselves are most vulnerable when our behavior is most automatic. Yes, this is true. Nor can a lower animal obtain a precious relief, leave a verbalization, or press relief, something wrong there, press relief, or uh, by verbalizing its distress. Far from despising lower animals, as is convenient to call them, he even corrects himself, for these deficiency, we should logically treat them with special consideration. So, as I wrote, that's my, my writing there now. So basically, because they can't talk, Russell suggests that we need to be more in, uh, empathetic to their needs and learn about their needs. 
because they can't unfortunately tell us. And if they could talk, I don't think we'd be doing experiments on them, to be honest. Uh, the concept of inhumanity. This is a direct quote also from the book. Um, we may then define the stress of a certain degree of whatever origin as a central nervous state of a certain rank on a scale in the direction of the mass autonomic response, which if protracted would lead to, this, to the physiological stress syndrome. Inhumane procedures are those which drive the animal's mood down in rank toward this point. Removing inhumanity must ultimately mean driving the animal as near the other end of the scale as we can. More humane then simply means less inhumane. We need only add that inhumanity can take two forms, acute and chronic, with no doubt every possible gradation between the two. That's my nice support there. Now we talk about, um, yeah, now it's a little complicated. So he split it into, when I say he, I'm always talking about Bill. Uh, so Bill split it into um, direct and indirect inhumanity. I think it was Bill, of course there's two people over the book, that's the same book. So there's direct inhumanity, and this is, you can't see it because my, way, but um, the infliction of stress as an unavoidable, consequence of the procedure employed so let's say you're studying pain and then there's a test where you make the foot of the animal hot you actually put it on a very hot surface and they retract it if you're studying pain you you, you probably i guess have to inflict pain maybe yeah i, I guess maybe there's other ways to do it now but at least at the beginning, you have to do it. So that's 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 direct. That's 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 unavoidable. And there's no point in doing a bad experiment on animal. Just don't do it at all then. So if you're going to cause pain and you need to cause pain, do it, but do it carefully with consideration. And find maybe you can do it another way. But if you can't do it another way, okay, but do it properly then. And if it needs to be a lot of pain, then if that's really good for the experiment, then you'll never have to repeat this again. So, so uh, plan your experiments well and do them properly and think about it and talk to your peers. Um, is this really necessary? And it is really necessary. Do it well. But, but that's so. We have, I'll come back to this. Right. So that's direct. Direct is unavoidable. Then there's a word that I wasn't for, for that familiar with. Contingent. So contingent is uh, happening by chance or without known cause, fortuitous or accidental. Uh, and we can call this from now on. Uh, indirect inhumanity, and this is the infliction of disease as an incidental and inadvertent byproduct of the use of the procedure, which is not necessary for its success. It's avoidable distress. So this one we can get rid of. This one we should get rid of, because if we get rid of the of the avoidable distress, the experiment will actually be better, not worse. Contingent inhumanity is not necessary for the success of the procedure. In fact, it may limit the success due to what uh, Bill called uh, psychosomatic disturbances. And these psychosomatic disturbances are likely to, to disrupt the biological investigation because it's, you're not controlling it. Um, and in an experiment, everything as possible should be under control. Okay. Is this direct or indirect in humanity? Discuss also you guys at home. Over Gary Larson. Tell me, direct, indirect. Is this avoidable or unavoidable? Is it trying to gauge the word? It seems unavoidable. Is it, it, yeah? Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. Depends what she's trying to do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It depends on her motivation. So if she didn't know, so if you have a parrot at home, they, they actually like to have the dark at night. So they, they generally cover them at night time. Also they're warmer. Um so if she if she didn't if she didn't think the blanket was, was scary for the for the, the bird, or actually it probably wouldn't be that scary because when it's closed, you wouldn't be able to see all that. But 
Um, if you didn't think it was scary, then um, it's, it's, it's avoidable. But if she was a bad woman and she was trying to scare that bird, then it's, it's direct. It's, uh, that's, that's contingent. So, so or, sorry, that's direct uh, uh, in humanity. Um, and I think Gary Larson, his joke is, because if you did it deliberately, it wouldn't be funny, right? So I think his joke was that she didn't know that the parrot was scared of these things. So then, in my opinion, it's definitely indirect. Um, so let's do another one. That's the Gary Larson. It's the same woman, I believe. What about this one? Direct, indirect in humanity. No, I think this one doesn't depend. I think she deliberately has locked that door and she's whistling to the dog, dinner time, Rex, 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 here, here, here. So if she's deliberately doing, what is it? Then it's direct in humanity. And this is not a nice woman. Because um, that dog is going to really hurt his face. I don't know, maybe it's her husband's dog and her husband did something. Yes. So what are factors governing indirect in humanity? So this is where we get now a little bit scientific and a little, a little less wishy-washy. Um, but again, remember, it's framed in 1960, 1959. So animal husbandry. What is animal husbandry? Anything you do to an animal that's, that's a domesticated animal. So that's transport, housing, handling, uh, the technicians that touch the arms, their experience and confidence. And I have an asterisk up there because they wrote in the book, I'm not going to discuss at all inexperience and incompetence because that should be taken for granted. So he took this out of the equation. They didn't talk to people who had crap lives, they talked to people who were brilliant scientists, brilliant thinkers, and they, they know that the, the technicians in those labs had experience and confidence. Okay, so there's a thing called um, incidence or prevalence and then the severity. Um, so incidence is basically how many animals will suffer. So basically kind of a number. And if you remember this thing from uh, Louis Pasteur, and the anthrax thing where he, where he heated up the anthrax and injected uh, 50 sheep, 25 were inoculated and 25 were not inoculated, the incidence here is 50, right? Remember the example? Yeah, so it's 50. The severity is how severe the distress is. So the control animals uh, all died because they weren't inoculated. So the severity here is death. So the incidence now, if you want to make the severity an incidence factor, the, the, the severity is death, the, and the incidence is 25 died, even though 50 animals were used. And there is some um, liability also if you're, if you're a control animal. But 25 had the ultimate severity, because death is the worst. No, it's not the worst thing, actually, sorry. Um, but I guess they, they died of anthrax poisoning, which is not a nice way to die. Um, and then we have to think about things like, so death, let's say death is the extreme, but again, not the worst because you can kill something or someone humanely, as I said. Um, so you've got things as well, like even if you don't kill the animal, post-operative pain. So it's quite common to take an organ out uh, of an animal, um, do something like for surgery or whatever, and put it back. Um, the mode of death, like in toxicity experiments, if, you're, if the animals are going to die of... Um, or kidney stones. They say it's the most painful thing in the world, at least for humans. I've heard women say it's more painful than childbirth. Um, I've never had uh, kidney stones, thank God. If you don't want to have kidney stones, drink anything. Just drink water, whiskey, whatever, drink a lot. Um, and then restraints. And that was my next, um, my next slide. This looks particularly awful. Hands up who thinks this looks awful. Uh, it's not actually that bad. So these are rabbits that, well, the bad thing is that they all have an uh, erectile thermometer in. So that's the bad thing. But the good thing is 
they're not killed. Um, these are animals used for the pirate and pest. Um, they're not, I don't think, I, I don't think the New Zealand rabbits are used anymore. Uh, I don't know for sure. But there is definitely alternatives to these. So what they do is they take the bunnies' ears and they inject them uh, with a little bit of substance, tiny amount. Does anybody know what a pyrogen test is? So a pyrogen is anything that makes you have a fever. So basically anything that goes into you um, medically needs to be tested. So all of our cell culture stuff is tested. Anything in the hospitals are tested. And that, that comes, like that's needles, syringes, anything has to be tested. So what they do is they, they soak them and I don't know, I don't know how they get the stuff off them. And pyrogen is typically uh, bacterial, parts of the bacterial cell wall, like LPS. So if bacteria grows on something and then you inject that into a child, a horrible example, and the child is in big temperature. I mean, well, they did it wrong, but they need to check that, that the stuff they use weren't contaminated previously. And, and, and the LPS can be from dead bacteria as well. So just, just all the claiming it doesn't help. So we, we need to test for pyrogens. So you inject a little bunny in his ear, which he doesn't really feel, with a few microliters or maybe, maybe a bit more of whatever the test substance is, and he gets, if, if he or she gets a little temperature, I mean, no big deal, right? And they don't kill them or anything. And they, they're there for three hours a day. It's their job. They get paid by food and, and they're three together. They're all having a good time apart from these three hours. And yes, they're restrained. So the restraints don't look nice. And if you look at the back end, which they don't show, obviously, they have a thermometer of their bones, which is probably not nice there. Uh, but apart from that, it's not too bad. If they actually get sick, it's only a mild temperature because they only put a tiny amount in. And they, they, they use them again a few weeks later when they're better. And usually there's no pyrogens in these things. So usually there's no, there's no positives. Um, I'll just do the slide and then we can have a break. Uh, so the removal of inhumanity for three years. This is back now to Russell and Birch. We turn now to consideration of the ways in which inhumanity can be and is being diminished or removed. These ways can be discussed under three broad headings of replacement, production, and refinement. The three modes now considered have conveniently been referred to as three years of humane technique. Replacement means the substitution for conscious living higher animals with those of insentient material. Reduction means uh, the reduction in the number of animals used to obtain information of a given amount and precision. And refinement means any decrease in the incidence of severity of inhumane procedures. There's a large overlap and intermingling of these three things. And it doesn't matter too much but I will discuss at length and in depth replacement, reduction, refinement of animals in the life sciences and particularly in toxicology um, over the next few lectures. And this is the concept from Russell Bridge and three years. Now we'll take a couple of breaks. Okay, so I stop here and I'll continue. So the first um, topic I'm going to talk about is replacement. Um, <clears throat> so replacement, uh, they defined as the substitution of conscious living higher animals with insentient material. So insentient means, um, well, I should look at the definition, but it means of no sentience, so not conscious. And we can argue what, what what would that mean actually for yeah please uh, in vitro testing yeah so so yeah so so I'm I'm made up we're all made up of about four trillion cells with, with approximately the same DNA and if we take the cells out of our body even though they're my human cells and put them in a dish we don't believe they're sentient but we know they're not sentient so I have no problem doing that I do it all the time actually. Um, but I mean more, <clears throat> could you think it would, would a worm be insentient? So that's that's a bit that's a bit trickier uh, because they don't have a very well developed nervous system. They probably can't feel pain. I don't think they can feel distress really, but they do 
I mean, they do have feelings, so but it's hard to know. But there's a lot of animals that are used in, in research that are not really considered animal models, like, like the experiments with Drosphelia and stuff like that. I don't think we have a real concern there. I mean, I guess if you're a very strong animal rights activist, you wouldn't really like that, um, that we even use insects. I mean, in, in, in proper, I, I don't mean to keep pick, picking on veganism, but it's just the most extreme, um, it's the most extreme view. So they say that avocados are not vegan. Does anybody know why avocados? I mean, there's no meat in avocados, but why are avocados not vegan? It's not sustainable. Right? Not no, veganism has nothing to do with sustainability. No, I know, but that's what that's why we decided. Yeah, but again, veganism has nothing to do with sustainability. I mean, they're shockingly bad for the environment. Yes, I agree with you. But why is it, why, why is it considered not vegan? It's because they use, um, uh, I think they're honeybees. So the, the farmed bees to pollinate them because they're, they're, they're not that big in, 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 in the wild. So these, these farmed ones are monsters of themselves. So, the, the, so they need the bees to pollinate them. And these bees are farmed. They come with the beekeepers and stuff like that. So it's not vegan. So uh, if, if you're a vegan and you eat avocado, you're not a vegan, <laughs> sorry. Um, so among this non sentient material, we include higher plants, microorganisms, and the more degenerate metazoan endoparasites in which nervous and sensory systems are almost atrophied. It's a bit of a wrong statement. It's not atrophied. It just never, it hasn't evolved. It never will evolve in those animals that you look at. Well, I don't know. It's hard to know. Um, so absolute, absolute, and it's two, yeah, make that more complicated. There's two types of replacement. There's absolute replacement, so no animals, no sentient animals are used. And there's a thing called relative replacement. This, are, this is where animals are used, but they're not exposed to either direct or indirect uh, inhumanity. So you can use an animal, and if you don't, if you don't distress it, distress it, then it's also a replacement, but it's called relative replacement. Now I have the guillotine here because this is a method we use. We used to use to kill people humanely. The French were famous for it. Off with your head. Um, and then Henry VIII borrowed the French tool. It wasn't a tool of torture. I mean, they did torture people before they put them in. I mean, poor uh, William Wallace was, what was it, hung, drawn, and quartered, where they pulled his body from limb to limb and then guillotined them. If you've seen Braveheart, it's brutal. Um, but the, the guillotine itself was actually a really humane way to kill people. I don't know why, it's not, that's, that would be, they should use that in America instead of the injections, it's cheaper. Um, but we use, we use the guillotine to kill animals. Um, in, in laboratory animals. So basically, it's a method that touches your head, and if you get it at the base of the neck, you're dead in, in seconds, uh, or not even seconds, you're dead immediately. Uh, another way to kill animals uh, humanely, it, it feels bad. I've done it myself, actually. Uh, when I was an undergraduate student, I had to, I had no choice, otherwise I wasn't going to get my degree. You take the scissors, take the rat's tail, and push this, the, the not, not the blade of the scissors, but the, the, the blunted end of the scissors on the rat's neck and pull his tail and the, the neck breaks. Um, they don't suffer at all if you do it properly. Uh, it, it is a bit rough to do. And you don't have a good day for the rest of the day when you, have, when you do that, but we have to do it. Um, I have my PhD thesis here. And for all of you guys who are thinking about doing a PhD uh, after your master's, I have not one single paper published during my PhD. None, and on, only as a, uh, a, an afterthought, I published two papers from it later. The one is an afterthought. Um, anyway, I, I show this because during my PhD, um, I was given the and I, I started my PhD in this animal um, replacement thing, 2001. It was I already was in Innsbruck for about six months, I finished it in Innsbruck, um, a bit longer. I went to Innsbruck in 2000, so it was nearly a year in Innsbruck. Uh, but I finished it in Dublin, went back and defended it in Dublin. Michael Ryan uh, was my professor um, uh, in the pharmacology department at UCD. And he had this EU project that was the first ever organ on a chip kind of thing. It was called the Minute System, and it was a macrofluidic device that I, I looked on the webpage a few weeks ago, and it seems to be, yeah, it seems to be gone, or if, if anybody finds out, it's still there. But there's much more sophisticated ones now, like the tissue swans and stuff like that. 
Um, anyway, so we had this cool device that had you put in a pump and it was plastic and you put your cells on these little filter inserts and put them in. But what cells did we want to use? So Walter Fowler was my now mentor in Innsbruck and he actually, the reason I was in Innsbruck because Michael Ryan and Walter Fowler were friends and they were in this EU project together. So Walter Fowler was very, um, was very familiar with, he's a nephrologist, so he's very familiar with kidneys and, and kidneys are very important toxicological targets. And Michael Ryan also was doing kidney research. And Walter uh, used to do a thing called isolated perfused kidneys. So this is where you uh, anesthetize an animal and in sit, no, you anesthetize an animal, you do all the surgery and remove the kidney. And then you can have the kidney in this kind of very complicated device called the isolated perfused kidney uh, prep. And then you can keep the kidney alive for a few hours. And it's cool because it has all of the architecture in there, but it dies eventually after about two hours. Um, and he was thinking we could grow the cells, proximal tubular cells uh, from the rat kidney. So then I tooled up and learned a little bit about animal handling and he told me you have to do this. And uh, I don't believe he actually showed me, I think he just told me on the phone. So I had to, I would order rats and three rats would arrive. And then I would take the rat out of the cage. And I, I was so scared doing this. I wasn't properly trained. It wasn't, that wasn't my fault. Uh, and I injected the rat with an anesthetic and then the rat would just go to sleep. I injected the rat with so much anesthetic, it was, it was never going to wake up. But it was breathing, and I was nice to it before. I actually liked the rats. And then I would um, open it up while it's alive. So you cut it here and open it up to here. I, I didn't have to break the chest open because I was after the kidneys. So I'd split the, there's a, there's a muscle here. I open that muscle. And then I would take, I would find the kidneys at the back of the arm because I was opening from the front. Um, and then I find the kidneys and then I would inject a solution, a cold solution that's basically sugar and salt. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's sugar, it was Krebs Henselet solution. And I injected this with a very large gauge needle into the uh, abdominal aorta. And then I would push this like 50 milliliters of this cold fluid through the animal's body and then if I did it correctly, the kidneys would have no blood in them and they would be bloodless. Now, Walter at the time thought that was the best way to do it. I found out later it was unnecessary. You could have, I could have just killed the animal and take out the kidneys. So I did that quite a lot. I think I, I, think I killed maybe uh, 20 rats. And the thing is my cells grew well for a day or two and then they all looked crap afterwards. And I was a bit annoyed because there was a guy who perfected that te technique called Lawrence Lash from America. I believe he's still active. And he could do it perfectly, but I, 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 I was a young scientist and I probably didn't follow all the protocols and I never talked to Lawrence. So, um, so yeah, so I had to do this a lot, a lot and this was relative replacement, but I killed rats and I worked on them while they were alive. I don't feel guilty about it because I was told to do that. I was trying to do a good thing because if you put the toxins on the cells, you're not causing the stress to the animal. And if I was properly trained, I mean, I was fine with rats, except that one time where I forgot an anesthetizer rat and put it back in the cage with the other rats, and then the other rats attacked it, and I was really distressed, really distressed. Uh, so not only was, and I think the rat was okay because it was asleep, but, the, but yeah, it was a horrible thing. And um, so anyway, I had to do that, and that's relative replacement. What happened later on, if you're interested, we started doing it with human cells, so we can get we got human kidneys. And they, they grew much better. Actually, I'm still using human kidney cells. Um, so, yeah, so if you anesthetize an animal, it's like if you go for surgery, right? The, the surgeon's not going to hurt you. So you get anesthetized if it's in a place where they can't do a local anesthetic. So that's what we did with the rats. And they were really well looked after. And, uh, and you can think of the alternative. So if I say I was interested in, I can't remember what I used at the time, Oh, one of the drugs we use is paracetamol, so acetaminophen. If we had to give them the rats acetaminophen, we wanted to give them enough to damage their kidneys. We'd have to give them a really a lot, so their liver would be more damaged first because it's primarily a liver toxin. Um, they would suffer like hell, you know. So this is this using animals, but without distressing them is called relative replacement. Yeah. What's the difference between red 
Thanks for that. It's fine. I can't hear you. Speak a little bit. Oh, sorry. What is the difference between relative replacement and refinement? Because refinement. I'm not talking about refinement yet. Oh, yeah. Let I me know. do. Let me do replacement first. Okay. Yeah. Remind me. Remind me. Like that. That you want to ask any questions. But I need. I need to discuss replacement first, and then we get to it. Um. So I probably said all this number. So. So you said, Leo, that, that you can use cells or tissues from an animal or from a human, actually, because humans are models as well of other humans. So, um, so you can use tissues and organs. Okay, there were thoughts in there. Um, uh, and as I said, one of the father was famous for the ice for his kidney. There was another guy, I forget his name, but he was in Germany and he's retired now as well. And uh, he was also pretty good with the ice age of his kidney, but only a few people in the world did it. Um, and not only can you take a whole organ like a kidney and take cells of it, you can also take parts of the kidney as an example of an organ. So the kidney is quite complex architecturally, and it's got these like snake-like uh, nephrons. And there was a guy from also from men's work called Harold Fulco that's in there, and he worked with a guy called Florian Lang. And Harold Fulco was a master at making isolated diffuse nephrons. He was the world master because it's such a, it's a micro dissection and it's really difficult to pull them out. And he managed to do, I uh, had 60, 70 publications figuring out how the nephron works using isolated perfused nephrons from rat kidneys. And I think Walter and, and Hal probably worked together that they wouldn't waste the organs because I know Walter only used one, probably, probably Harold used the other one. So if you're using an animal, you should use all of it as much of it, of it as possible. And in modern day now, I know that happens. So if you kill a rat, you, you announce it to the university and, and basically the vultures come and take all pieces of it for their experiments, which is good. Um, so they're becoming less popular and cell culture is now becoming the most popular thing ever. And that's what I am. I'm a cell culture specialist. I'm, I'm more of a cell culture specialist than I am a toxicologist. It's funny. I spend all my life trying to grow beautiful, healthy cells, and then I put toxins on them. Now, it's really weird because you can't predict the future, but somehow Russell and Birch did because they said in 1959 already, mammalian tissue cultures have become one of the most important replacement techniques and indeed one of the most important developments of knowledge. And that was not true, at least for toxicology. So the cells back in 1959, apart from a couple like LSPK1 cells that were terrible, they were all developed either accidentally or for viral replication. They weren't developed for toxicological experiments. And even today, I, I'm, 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 I'm a, an editor on a journal called Toxicology in Vitro. And there is some quite poor paper submitted using cancer cells and pretending that those cancer cells are not cancer cells, not pretending. They, because they think if you take cells from a lung, um, there must be human lung cells. Well, not if they're not if they're it's a horribly cancerous cell. They don't represent human biology. I mean, they represent parts of human biology, but not not well. You're better off taking primary lung cells or making a, a cell line on purpose. Um, yeah. Now, I, I, I made this slide this morning, so uh, that's my brother. Robert, and I'm not sure why I have him there. Let's see if I remember. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you have absolute replacement examples. Um, they gave in the book. Uh, so I don't know if anybody know what an enzyme amino acid is. You should, I think. It's where you have an antibody on a plastic 96 well plate. Then you put in the, your analyte and you shake it and you wash it off. And you put in another antibody with a marker. Usually, it's phosphorylated peroxidase. And you use a color reagent, and the more color, the more antigen. Yeah. And they used to do those with animals. I don't really know what they did, but they, I guess they would inject a, a compound into an animal uh, to biologically determine how much of the antigen was there right, or, or the activity or something. Um, or actually, I do have an example. So just remember the slide now. So you all know about Botox, right? Is it Botox or Blotox? Botox. 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 So it's from the botulinum toxin, right? So it's one of the most toxic compounds that is not radioactive ever known. So I heard my lecture from Master and I said, 
in the range of ridiculous cross reference, that 100 milligrams of uh, botulinum toxin would kill every single man, woman, and child on the planet. And there's 8 billion of us. So 100 milligrams. And people don't object. They say their faces. Yeah, so uh, it's toxic because it is what does it do? Um, it blocks nerves yeah, in the muscles, right? So that's why your face looks unfortunate. And people think that's sexy or something. I know. Uh, don't do it. Um, oh yeah, I had this ex this um, example. This way, I think I remember. So uh, this example uh, that happened to me once uh, when I was doing when I was an undergraduate student, we were doing on a weekly basis small animal experiments to learn about toxicology and physiology, and we we used animals mammals as a representation of a human, as a model of a human. And one of these experiments we did, they were really well set up. You know, they were, they were perfectly conducted. Accidents happened. And one of them, time, the, the, the lab technician at the time, I forget his name, he was a great guy. He, uh, he chloroformed all the rats. I think it was chloroformed. Um, but to, just subtly so they weren't dead. Because we needed them alive to do the, this, what's called the fungal strip experiment. And the fungal strip is a, mus a part of the muscle on the stomach. And uh, what you can do is you can cut off the stomach and tie the fungal strip on between these two cantilevers. And then you can measure the tension. So you can add things like histamine and, and the histamine blockers. And so it'll contract. And then if you block it, it won't contract. And we had a reader that's a bit like one of those light detecting tests that goes and, and it was all cool because these were all old but really really nicely intended machines and we we're excited and a bit nervous to do it and we had to write a report and it was examined and all that kind of stuff. So my, my rat came like everybody else is in the room there was about 15 of us I think and the rat came and we, we, we a, a PhD had come and told us how to do the experiment she exactly what to do she was in the room and our technician which was a master technician for the animals was in the room he had anesthetized the animals so it was all safe we all have lab coats on, it's all fine. I had my every, the, the, the PhD student asked to check if the animals were breathing because she believed it wouldn't work if they weren't. So we all check. And then you check if the animal is, is, is genuinely anesthetized and can't feel pain. And what you do with rats is you squeeze very hard. You don't break your foot, but you squeeze really hard on their ankle. And they hate that. So if they're awake, they, they, they twitch, even if they're asleep, if they can feel pain. So we really check carefully if they didn't feel any pain. And then you put ethanol on them, and also if they're if they're sensing that they hate the smell of that, and also it irritates their skin. So if they were conscious, you would know already at that stage. Then take a scalpel and cut throat to to ends. Open it up. Uh, again, you pull the nerves of muscle out, being very careful that the skin and the hair doesn't get back into the animal. I'm not sure why we were that careful, but in my mind it was we don't want to contaminate the animal, even though we're never going to wake up. And uh, so uh, I took out the stomach and now this is where I got a bit distracted. So I, I put the animal to the side, still alive. I was about to kill it. I was going to kill it when I was ready. So but, as I said, you just break its leg. So I had the, the stomach in a petri dish of a buffer and the animal was lying there still breathing, but not feeling any pain. It can't feel any pain. All its entrails were out now because I was had just taken the stomach out. And the animal turned over on its own. So that turned over on its own. And I am so scared. I was like, fuck, I had no idea what to do. The PhD student was in the other room helping somebody else. And my heart, Jesus Christ. And then the thing ran with all its entrails. It ran along, I didn't get far. It had no stomach and it had no blood because it just because it was bleeding out. And it ran and I just called the guy. I can't for the life of remember his name. But I put my hand up and I said, hey, 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 whatever his name is, the, the lab technician. And he was there in a second. And he grabbed the rat and he killed it with the cervical dislocation. And I thought, oh, fuck. I will never, ever forget that. It was horrible. And then I had to go and finish my experiment. I didn't smoke at the time, so I couldn't go out and have a smoke and relax. I did the experiment. I can't remember what grade I got, but it was awful. So my whole point of that silly story is that 
We don't need to do that anymore. We have computers. We could have easily, but no, at the time we couldn't have done it on the computer because there was no software to do that. But today, people never do those experiments anymore. So you can absolutely replace those nonsense experiments today with computers. They weren't nonsense at the time. But now there was absolutely no need to do that. I was only trying to learn how histamine um, binds receptors and learn a little bit of antagonism. And it's cool to do it, but you can also coolly do it on these new computers. I don't know, did anybody use such simulations before physi physiological? You have? Okay. Um, And also, you can use physiochemical information. Say, say you're a lab and you want to know uh, what to test or what not to test, basically. There's, there's no need to test something that's corrosive. You can see, you can see it in the, in the chemical structure. Or if it's really acidic, there's absolutely no need to test it. You don't need to test it at all. Just write on the label if it's corrosive or it's, or it's, uh, it's, uh, it's acidic. Now, Maybe I'm not exactly right. Maybe the chemical structure doesn't tell you that, but it's easy to test that. You know, you can put it in a pH meter, or you can you can use even skin preparations, simple ones, uh, just to check it. Does it burn the skin? Okay. Uh, so you don't need to test if if acid is going to come off a duck's back. So there's a saying in English. Maybe you don't know it. It's like water off a duck's back. It means it's nothing to me. Don't worry about it. And water doesn't stick on a duck's back because they have this um, lubricant on, um, but they're always preening. And I think it comes from the feathers, the base of the feathers. And they always are spreading it, so they're waterproof, basically. Now, here we go with the fidelity and discrimination. Now, I can guarantee none of my colleagues I've heard of fidelity and discrimination. This is again from Russell Lambridge. So this is core to the whole lecture series. A perfect model of the human organism would obviously be indistinguishable by any test from its original. Any other in vivo model must depart in some degree from the original. So I said we use these animals. Quite a lot. Mice, rats, dogs, pigs to represent the human. Actually, the closest is the pig, but they're quite expensive to, to do, so we don't use pigs at all. And actually, pigs are not used, as far as I know, in toxicological experiments at all. Again, maybe because they're too expensive, um, because you can't eat them after you've done the experiment, obviously. Um, so, so what fidelity? You've heard, I don't know if you guys have heard of high fidelity. It used to be written on all the way, or all the CD player, you probably don't even know what CD players, but we used to have things called CD players or even record players. You must have seen, have seen a record once. Vinyl, vinyl, that's what you guys call it. And if you bought good speakers, it said high, high fidelity. There's even a very good film called High Fidelity. I'm sure you know the last name. Um, so fidelity means an overall proportionate difference. So high fidelity means all properties are equally or equally badly uh, reproduced, but let's say equally. Now, what would be the best model? Let's say, let's say I want to take a drug. What's the best model for me? First one, me. But you know, the weird thing is, I'm a great model for me now. I'm not necessarily a great model for me in 10 years. So if I had a disease, it'd be best if I could take the drug before I got the disease and as quickly afterwards get the disease and then the drug that would cure it. Uh, because in 10 years from now, I'm going to be 57 and um, I don't live the most healthy lifestyle. And even if I did, I used to run marathons. Um, that, that, that wrecks your knees anyway. So, so there's no escaping aging. So I would be probably not the best model for myself in 10 years. I it would be pretty good though, right? So it would be as good as you can get. Uh, but, but men are easier than women because women have all have much more complicated life stages and you have more you have cycles in your hormones while you're fertile and even after fertility as well. And then people take hormone replacement therapies, all that kind of stuff. So men are, you know, men are not, uh, 
good models for themselves and, and women it's even much much more complicated um, and, and we use mice to try and represent the entire human population i mean it's crazy actually but yeah what can we do um so that's that's uh that's all i have, I have this example of coffee right so just as an example of why you're not necessarily a good model for yourself so you know we, we don't give children coffee why do you think that is It's, be, it's because they can't metabolize it. So they're, they miss an enzyme called cytochrome P450, cytochrome P51A1, I think, and they don't have it. And in the adults, we have it in abundance in our liver, but kids don't have it. So kids could actually die of, of caffeine because they, they uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not, not if they drink a small bit, but if you gave them coffee every day, it could kill them because they, they would have toxic levels of caffeine. And we metabolize it really fast. And some people are fast. I mean, for me, I can drink coffee all day and I sleep, no problem. But some people who don't drink coffee might not have these hands any juice. And then I've heard people drink coffee at 10 o'clock in the morning and they can't sleep for two days. I wish that would be. Um, so that's, that's so that, that kid is not a great model for a funny boy. But that kid is not a great model for himself growing up if you talk about caffeine. And, and caffeine is a drug, actually all cannabis. What's discrimination? Discrimination is the extent to which the model reproduces one particular property of the original. This is just to please um, some people who know me because I'm pretty bad at chemistry and uh, this is happening in the family. So I was right this morning to I know, I think it's a 1A1. Anyway, let's see if 2A1 is um, Yeah, I, I just wanted to develop that a little bit more that we change, but we also change seasonally. The Irish have a great habit of completely being greedy people at Christmas time. <laughs> On Christmas day, we start drinking at like 10 o'clock in the morning. Like uh, uh, when we get up, my dad is ready there with a glass of wine or champagne or whatever. We make Irish coffees all day, which is basically whiskey and milk, or not milk, cream and moist. And then we eat so much food that we fall asleep afterwards because uh, the turkey is loaded with tryptophan, which makes it sleepy. And turkeys aren't even Irish. But the thing is, Irish used to eat geese for, for traditionally, and just turkeys are cheaper now. So it's only turkey. Um, yeah, I, that's so. At the weekend, I was watching the Six Nations rugby, and I had a little tipple of uh, Dan Bidet, 15 year of age, which is not good for me, but I like it. Um, so, we're basically doing experiments, self testing on ourselves, and self experimenting ourselves all the time, and all these unhealthy things. And I generally, I, I used to run, as I said, marathons, and I'd run it always in October because that was when a double marathon was. So, in, in September, I was a fit man. And then I wouldn't go on again until, I don't know, February. And then Christmas in the middle. And I put on so much weight over Christmas. And I did that every year. So I'm not sure. I don't think I would particularly help you. So going marathons may not be healthy. And then, I, don't, I, I think I've referenced this before, but the H. Polori guy, uh, so it was an Australian scientist who actually tested himself to prove the theory that uh, H. Polori was uh, causing ulcers. So he did self experiments on himself. And I, I mean, Found a cure for ulcers, which were really bad at the time. And everybody thought it was because he was stressed, he got an ulcer. But it wasn't, it was bacteria. And nobody believed him. So he went to the lab one day and he told his mate, You don't, I think you don't need ethical permission if you do it on yourself because you're, you're informed of yourself. Anyway, he signed whatever documents he needed. And they, he got a, a, a physician to check, put an endoscope in and check his stomach. And it's a fully healthy. And so he said, Right. So he drank the bacteria, he drank the H. pylori. And he waited a few weeks and then he was feeling really crappy. And he went back to his, to the, to his, uh, um, his physician and his physician put the endoscope down again. He said, Jesus, you got really bad ulcers. And he said, it's working, <laughs> cool. And then he took uh, an antidote that he checked in the lab that killed H. pylori. He checked that it kills that one and he drank that Came back to two weeks later, and I said, You're a joke. This is crazy. You've just discovered the cure for ulcers, which nearly everybody had. 
and from then on. So if you don't have an ulcer, you just need an antibiotic. Okay, back to the book. So high fidelity model, low fidelity model, right? This is a model for what's called well, it's the pecking response response of these uh, um, golds. We have the actual long name of the gold. So in this, in this from Tim Bergen and Ferdick in 1950, they published this paper that is referenced by uh, Rosalind Birch in the book Michael Ball's Bridge. And basically, they took the head of a gold. I assume they just found the dead one. I don't think they killed the gold. Uh, and you know, a taxidermy, you can stuff it and, and make it look, you know, that was rot. And they, they were just checking um, to see if they could if they could set up an experiment to, to see why the, 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 those chicks um, never peck when it's a foreign bird in, or like a different species. So they, they put the head in and the, the, the chicks pecked the head because that's what they do, those particular kinds of chicks do to say when they're hungry. They just peck at the thing. And then the mum knows which ones to feed. Because if it stops pecking, it's already fed. It can't be anymore. So they did that, and this is with the natural head, and they had that pecking rate, so that's their control. Uh, and then they had a standard model, which wasn't an actual head, it was a wooden thing. So just like a, like if somebody made it in a workshop. And then they used the bill only of the wooden thing, and then they used a stick. And the stick had three lines on it. Well, they played around with the stick until it, it worked. And the stick, this thing, the three yellow lines, the red stick, the three yellow lines, it looks absolutely nothing like that, right? Nothing like it. Um, they had a higher pecking response. And uh, you don't know what birds see. I mean, they don't have the same vision as us. They're, they've evolved to see in very long distances. And, for the, and, and also, we don't know if baby chicks see more poorly or more close up. So anyway, what it was, it had to be read with three yellow spots. So you can see somehow maybe that the cues are on that bill, but I mean, I can't see, I don't see why it would be like that. Anyway, that was the evolutionary cue for those chicks to peck. A red thing with three yellow ones in it. So that's an example of a low fidelity model, but that's, that has high discrimination. You could, put, you could put anything else in. If you change the color of that, I assume they wouldn't peck at all. And that low fidelity model had better dissemination than an actual head of a goal. The high fidelity fallacy. The high fidelity fallacy might suggest that for man, a member of another placental mammal species would be a, a model of higher fidelity than a bird or microbe. The major premise states that the highest possible fidelity is always desired in medical research and that the testing of biological substances, the stubborn conclusion is that mammals are always the best model. Fidelity is required of a model if we are fully ignorant, although our ignorance is often exaggerated. Fidelity of mammals as models of man may be greatly overestimated and the main point. So, Bill was funny because his jokes weren't funny, you know that? So, so unfunny, he's funny. And this was his, after all, in the matter of tales, we ourselves are more like frogs than monkeys. It's hilarious. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, just hang on a second while I stop this and I'm thinking of your exercises too. Thank you.